I'd like to begin for a moment just to reflect on the importance of stories in medicine. This is a subject very dear to my heart as a former journalist. Um, I used to, as a documentary maker, tell other people's stories for a living. And now as a doctor, I do the opposite. I listen very carefully and very attentively to my patient stories in the hope that with a team around me together, we can help shape those life stories for the better. The author, Philip Pullman, who himself is no slouch at storytelling, once encapsulated the importance of stories very beautifully, I thought, when he said, and I'll try and remember his quote entirely accurately, he said, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, what we need most of all in the world is stories. I think that's completely true, and nowhere more so than in the NHS, where what heals is not simply a doctor's drugs or scalpel, it is also the way in which all of us who are involved in the NHS and healthcare help on a more humane level our patients. We hold them, we hear them, we try and make sure that they are aware that they are heard and held and understood. This, the, the importance of stories in medicine was, was struck, um, was brought home to me last week by a particular story I heard from the Royal Marsden um, in Cancer Hospital in London. And a play specialist there talked about how she had been wrestling with the challenge of caring for children who have to undergo radiotherapy. So when that happens, nobody else can be in the radiotherapy room when that treatment is delivered. So of necessity, a, a child, sometimes a young child, will be separated from their mother or father. It can be daunting, frightening, as you can imagine. And the play specialist came up with a beautiful idea. She invented, as she called it, magic string. And magic string was very simple. It was a ball of multicolored twine, one end of which could be held by the child in the scanner, the other end of which was thread under the lead-lined door and could be held outside the room by the parent. So this was a literal thread that was also a narrative thread. It was a story that a child, alone, afraid, in a scanner, could tell themselves while they were there, that they were still loved and held and protected by their parents. And I thought that was the most beautiful example of how a story can help. As Ros says, I work in a, a wonderful hospice, Sobel House in Oxford, and from day one that I worked there, I have been struck overwhelmingly by how important it is for all of us involved in end-of-life care to really listen to what our patients are telling us, never to try and impose a doctor's agenda on their last, the last phase of their life, but to listen to what matters to them, to their story. So what are they afraid of now? How do they hope this final phase of their life will go? What would they like to achieve? What are their goals? What are they frightened of and how can we help? I'm going to come back to um, Sobel shortly, but I'm going to turn away now for a moment to tell the story very briefly of the junior doctor dispute last year and this terrible battle which no doctor ever wanted, but nonetheless we all became embroiled in with the government about the terms and conditions of our contract. Um, I've realised I have no... I have no clicker in order to you let me see if there's one here <laughs> yeah there is right so let's see if this works very good um, so this dispute kicked off when um, Jeremy Hunt the health secretary gave a speech back in 2015 so so quite a long time ago now in, in which he said essentially that there was a, a huge problem in the NHS with the way in which care was delivered at weekends. And this problem meant that 11,000 people a year in Britain were dying avoidably, unnecessarily, because doctors were not working enough weekends. Um, it was a pretty 
shocking accusation for doctors to hear. It really felt like an accusation. It was reported in the media as such. The Daily Telegraph, I remember that day, had a headline all across the front page saying, Hunt goes to war with doctors. And it kicked off this very ugly and traumatic dispute in which, um, as you all, I'm sure all know, we went on strike a number of times. We believed we were striking for one thing. The government argued we were striking to preserve our weekend pay. Personally, I didn't really give a damn about my weekend pay, and I certainly would have never gone on strike for that reason. But what I did care deeply about was my patients and my patient safety. And, and a lot of us juniors, um, in a sense, what we felt we were striking for was a story about the NHS and the way in which the NHS was delivering care at the time. There was undeniably a problem with keeping patients safe at weekends, but tinkering with the contract um, according to which junior doctors were employed in the NHS didn't stand a chance of fixing that problem. There were no extra resources whatsoever promised by the government to increase weekend services, literally not one penny. Um, and we all felt as though the idea that you could somehow suddenly stretch a five-day NHS across seven days in the absence of resources was ludicrous. And I think the one thing you can say about stories is they only resonate with us, with the public, if they're true. And there was a glaring untruth at the heart of this idea that we could make the NHS safer by stretching the work that doctors were doing ever more thinly without any more resources. At that point, I had completely buried my journalistic past. I had spent 10 years as a television journalist. I'd done a lot of political programs. I'd often had as my adversary people like Alistair Campbell and Peter Mandelson back in the days of the Blair government who would try very, very hard to control any interviews we did with anyone from the Blair government. Um, I knew how politics worked, but I decided very deliberately when I became a medical student to put all of that on one side and forget about it because now I was a doctor. But somehow this dispute, I, I felt as though I couldn't stay quiet because I believed so strongly that we needed to speak out, all of us to put our heads above the parapet, because what was being proposed, a seven-day NHS without any extra funding, was actually dangerous for patients, and therefore it was part of my duty as a doctor to speak out. And one of the advantages of having a previous background in journalism was I, I, I knew how to do that. I, I knew how um, the whole game, and to some degree it is a game, of um, um, media management and spin and trying to control the message worked. And so a lot of us junior doctors, we had nothing to do with the BMA. We had never stood up and spoken out before, but we all started speaking out because we all believed we were doing something that was important to patients. I'm going to show a little film now, which was something that I organized with a friend of mine, a junior doctor from London, um, just before one of the junior doctor strikes. At this stage in the dispute, Jeremy Hunt was refusing to engage in any kind of negotiations with the BMA, our union at all. He said, nope, that's it. I'm not engaging. You've had my final offer, and I don't care if you're going to go on strike. That's it. And we thought very strongly this was, this was wrong, that always talking is better than striking, and we decided to try and do something about it. So... This is what we did. Do you think he's going to be there? It's less than two weeks till the next strike. He's got to be in London. He's got to be in his office trying to yeah, fix this. Yeah, you've got to be. You've got to hope he's trying to do something to stop the strikes, and that's what we're here to do as well. We've got to talk. I'm sorry to bother you. We're both junior doctors, and we've come here today because we would very much like to talk to the Secretary of State, Jeremy Hunt. My name's Dagan. This is Rachel. We're junior doctors. He's told us many, many times that his door is always open to junior doctors and we need to speak to him. What you could possibly do is let the health secretary know that we'll wait for him for the whole day and the whole night. If he has even a few minutes to talk to us, we'd be very, very grateful. Um, and there will be doctors here every day from now until 
a time he sees fit to speak to us. We're told that Jeremy may not be in the building but that they're going to get a, a message to him and we hope the British public will see that junior doctors are desperate to avoid further strike action. The message is really, really simple. It is time to talk. There has never been a more important time to talk and there are 54,000 junior doctors who want to talk to him and we will be here in shifts for as long as it takes. It's time to talk. So strangely, Jeremy didn't talk to us that day. And so we did exactly what we said we would to the Department of Health front desk. We camped outside the front entrance of Jeremy Hunt's department for 24 hours. We slept rough on the streets of London. Both of us have young children. We're in our 40s. It was a ludicrous thing to do, really. But we believed in it. We thought it was important. And those two policemen um, were very alarming when they came up to us at the start of our little peaceful protest. Um, we checked out the legality of doing this in advance, but we still didn't know if anyone would try and stop us. So when two big burly policemen came along, we were a little bit anxious. And in fact, what they did, and some of you may be familiar with what has happened to the police service over the last sort of four or five years, their numbers have been cut by 20,000 police officers. Um, and they're all having a pretty tough time of it themselves. These two guys from the Met came up to us and said, OK, what, what are you doing, doctors? And we explained. And then that chap who I'm talking to, who is about three times the size of me, said, Lent Ford, and he said, now you listen to me, Rachel. If anyone tells you you can't be here, you tell them that is a downright lie, and you've heard that from the Met. And if anyone tries to move you away, you call me and here's my number. Don't let them do what to you, what they did to us. You're fighting for your patients and you carry on. And at that stage, I felt quite emotional. I could feel myself almost crying and I flung my arms around him and gave him a great big hug, which I'm not sure he was expecting, but it was lovely to have that solidarity. Um, so we got a lot of press coverage with our, um, our, our protest, which was in part what it was designed to do. And there's Channel 4 News interviewing us on the first day of our protest. And there we are at about 11 o'clock at night. I was quite hysterical by then. <laughs> um, and we camped all night in our sleeping bags. What was very, very interesting about this protest was a lot of Department of Health staff came in and out of the building while we were there. And some of them came up to us and said, go on, give us a BMA badge, I'll put it in my handbag. I mustn't tell anyone that I've taken it, but we're on side. We really think that you're trying to stand up for patients. Um, and after the dispute, um, ultimately that protest didn't achieve anything you could say. It didn't result in Jeremy Hunt speaking to any of us. The strikes carried on. Eventually, everything fizzled out. I felt very... Um, just exhausted and demoralized by the whole experience. And, and, and I had actually applied for my speciality training job in palliative care, but withdrew my application. I felt I needed a little bit of time out. And I spent that time writing this book, um, which is in part a little bit about the strike year, but mainly it's about what it's like being a, a junior doctor in the NHS and how, hard, how very hard it is to hold your patients' lives in your hands when you are so overstretched and understaffed that you can't feel you can necessarily keep them safe, let alone provide them with high-quality care. And this leads back to Sobel House. Um, I mentioned right at the start that stories are incredibly important, both for our patients but also for the NHS writ large. And it seems to me as though for the last couple of years, there are two stories we tell ourselves about the NHS. One is the idealised story, which is rooted in why the NHS was first brought into being in 1948, nearly 70 years ago. Our health service exists because then we, as a British population, believed so strongly that anyone who has the misfortune to be ill in British society 
should receive the highest quality medical care, no matter what their wealth or status or power or voice in society. And those shining ideals drove the NHS 70 years ago and they still drive the NHS now. And of course, that is why, if you look at any poll about what makes Britons most proud, the NHS always tops the bill. Personally, I think if we did one now, David Attenborough would pit the NHS to the post. But in general, the NHS is there. And it's there because I think it gives us a story we can tell ourselves about what matters to us. We're all fundamentally pretty decent people. We're kind, we're compassionate, we care about each other. We don't want a baby or an elderly person or somebody who is physically or mentally suffering from illness to suffer because we, despite being the world's sixth richest economy, are not willing to provide health care. That's the idealised story of the NHS. But of course, it's belied in all kinds of ways by the day-to-day -day reality. So in Sobel House, I feel as though I am lucky enough and blessed enough as a doctor to be living that ideal of the NHS. We're well-staffed, we're well-resourced, and I have the time and space to really care for my patients and to be the compassionate doctor I want to be. Far too often, doctors and nurses and not just them, paramedics, physios, speech therapists, you name it, they're all run ragged. There aren't enough of them. Supply does not meet demand, not even close. And that leads to the very opposite of good quality health care. In a sense, that is exactly what doctors were on strike for fundamentally. The very best deaths in a hospice can be deaths that are surrounded by love, that are saturated with dignity and as much meaning and comfort as it is possible to achieve at the end of someone's life. But too often the reality in an under-resourced NHS is the exact opposite. And one story I'd like to leave you with is from a friend of mine, a very young doctor, who last year, last winter, so in January, was a house officer in her very first year as a doctor. It was right at the height of the winter crisis. It was at a time when the British Red Cross were so horrified by conditions in accident and emergency departments that they described them as a humanitarian crisis. Thousands of patients lined up in corridors on trolleys, ambulances queued up in their hordes outside hospitals, appalling, appalling care for patients. And she was asked, by somebody senior in the accident and emergency department to escort a patient from the department up in the lift to a floor, seven or eight floors above, where they had found a bed. She was told, you have to go now, you've got to get the patient out now, we don't have beds, we need this bed. And she obediently said okay, and went off with a porter and a patient on a trolley. As it turned out, the patient, unbeknownst to my friend, was dying and after she was moved into the lift and the lift set off up to the eighth floor, the patient died before her eyes. She had only been a doctor for six months. She didn't know what to do. She watched a patient die literally in transit, more like a FedEx parcel than a human being. Such was the urge to get this patient out of the department. And I'm not sure I would blame anybody in the department necessarily for even attempting that when the conditions were ambulances sat outside with patients who were also desperately ill who couldn't even be taken off the ambulances into the department because it was so overcrowded. But nobody hearing that story could pretend that is good care. It is not world-class care. It's not even basic humane care. It's appalling. And that's the other story simultaneously that I think we have to confront about the NHS. We have these wonderful ideals about what NHS care means to us and is to us every day when we get it right. But we also have patients dying in lifts like FedEx parcels because there aren't enough doctors, nurses, beds or resources. And I would like to leave everybody with a, a simple thought, which is from my own experience, um, first as a journalist, and then as a, a doctor who never spoke out, who just kept her head down and did doctoring, I loved it every day, I didn't need to speak out, who then turned back to journalism because I felt so strongly I needed to speak out about our underfunded NHS. 
I've learned one simple thing. Any of us can be a leader. It's really, really simple because being a leader is simply a matter of telling a story that is true. It is speaking out and saying, this is what's happening. These are the conditions now for me, for my patients, and I am going to stand up and say what's happening out loud because I have a duty to patients. I want the NHS to be delivering the best care possible. I don't want anyone else to die on a trolley in a corridor or in transit in a lift upstairs because we don't have enough beds or nurses or doctors in the NHS. And I know it's incredibly hard to influence politics, unbelievably so, but there are 1.4 million people who work in the NHS, and there are probably at least several million more who work in the charity third sector that is allied to the health service. So there's an awful lot of us who can speak out. And in my fantasy world, the next stage of the NHS's story is one in which it does receive the funding it so desperately needs. It is able to continue its story as this wonderful ideal that represents the very best of Britain and the very best of our values of caring and loving and wanting to show compassion for each other because I don't think anyone in Britain wants anything less. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Rachel, uh, for sharing that story of your story and the story of the NHS strike. I just want to say that Rachel is going to sign a few of her books if anybody would like to go downstairs to the bookstall down in the exhibition hall. Lots of books for sale, but Rachel will be signing her book immediately after this presentation. But also to say there is a play for any of you who've still got the energy at 6.15 in Hall 1C. It's called Out of the Box. I've seen it. You'll enjoy it if you've still got a thirst for anything. It will make you laugh. But Rachel, have we got time for a question? Is there a question for Rachel? I guess my question is, Rachel, you obviously never worried about jeopardizing your career in terms of the political statements. Uh, you're not best friends with Jeremy Hunt, I can tell that. <laughs> well, actually, the opposite. I was terrified initially about speaking out. Um, I was very, very worried that my local trust might disapprove of one of their junior doctors um, telling the truth as they saw it. Um, and I really loved being a doctor. I did not want to jeopardize my job in any shape or form. I didn't care so much about Jeremy Hunt, oddly. Um, I, I, <laughs> I never have done. <laughs> and I think that's because if you're in the NHS, and if you're there because you care about patients and you want to do a good job, it doesn't matter what job you're doing. Every single job, a doctor, a nurse, a play therapist, um, a grief counsellor, we're all of us doing it for really simple reasons. We're not doing it because we want to be powerful or famous or find status or wealth. We're definitely not going to get that in the NHS. We're just doing it because we care about patients. And so... In a way, what motivated me was I just felt like it was an extension of acting according to my duty as a doctor, which is to act in my patient's best interests. And it didn't stop me being scared, but it did make me fearless at the same time because it was important. I know you've inspired many to speak out since, though. Can I? Yeah? Yes. Um, hello, microphone well, two. First of all, I, I don't think anybody can argue with the passion and, um, and what you've been saying today, yes? but I'm going to stick my head above the parapet and think it's very easy to criticise the politicians for not doing the right thing, and it's easier, easy to be an outsider on that. You're obviously incredibly intelligent, incredibly driven, yes? Have you ever not thought about getting into that side where you can influence where the money comes <laughs> from? Because quite frankly, I've got to be honest, until we get more money, we can all scream as much as we can, yep. and you, in the polite way, you're screaming really professionally. I like it. But... <laughs> It's not going to change until, and it's taxpayers, guys. It's yes. us who's got to fund this, it's not somebody else. Yep. So I really have to put that just to balance today's presentation <coughs> from you to say there are two sides to a story. Yeah. We've heard your one side, which I'm with, but 
there are other sides, and I think that money has to be said here, that this isn't done from people sitting in Parliament saying, ah, we've got tons of money, but we'll, we'll not pay for anything else. There are other sides. Yeah, yeah. I completely agree with you. Um, and, of course, ultimately, who decides the trajectory of a government? It is us. It's the British public. And, therefore, ultimately, you could argue the buck doesn't stop with Jeremy Hunt or Theresa May or Jeremy Corbyn or whoever's in power. It stops with us, the British electorate. Um, however, where I think the buck does stop with politicians is um, they have the responsibility for having a leading an honest debate with the electorate about whether or not it is possible to sustain a high quality safe NHS on the current budget and that's where they fall down so terribly they 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 could easily say and and I think Many of us in the NHS are so desperate for them to, to say this, to be candid in this way. They could say, look, we can't have a world-class health service without a world-class budget. It is really simple. There are two choices. Either we pay for a world-class health service or we decide all the ways in which we're going to cut what the NHS provides in order to meet the budget we're willing to spend. But we can't do it both ways. Now, we could put that choice to the British public. Dare I say it, we could even have a referendum on the NHS, although I'm not sure I would particularly recommend another referendum given the way the last one went. Um, but we could do that. Um, but until politicians are honest about that dichotomy, either we cut the NHS or we fund a wonderful world-class service, they're not leading, they're just playing games and they're just conducting themselves through the mouthpieces of spin doctors and that's where I think we can and should hold politicians to account and actually ultimately, in a way I feel as though trying to influence the media is perhaps the most successful way to reach out to the public and hopefully to make people care about what's really happening because at the moment, of course, the government has a dominant role to play in influencing um, the mainstream media and the way in which it writes about the NHS. And if they're not doing that honestly, then we have to find ways to influence the message. So he hence my focus. I, I think I might find it difficult being a politician, but maybe I should. <laughs> Thank you. Last question, Tracy. Rachel, just taking politics to one side for a second, because we won't sort that out today, but I'm wondering if practically there's more that we can do by working together. So we know that 50% of people roughly are dying in hospitals every year, and lots of the projects that we're doing are about trying to get people out and get them home and into the community and for hospices to do more. But we won't get everybody out, and I'm struck by the fact that some people will want to be there or need to be there, or it might just be an emergency. Somebody's come off their motorbike and they're in the last couple of hours yes. of life and they're, they're going to be in a hospital. So I was struck when I read your book that you were talking about um, how you wanted to be compassionate and you, you were running two pages and you just literally didn't even have the time to put your arm around somebody, but you desperately wanted to and it, and it was tearing you apart. But I'm wondering, are there things that we can do together? Are there things that we can do with volunteers? Are there things that we can do to share our knowledge to help the situation now with people who are dying in hospital and make it better? Yes, completely and utterly agree with that um, on, in so many different ways. I mean, one way in which I think we could achieve that, and this is a, a, a sort of fantasy, future fantasy of mine, I, I would love us to inhabit an NHS of the future where palliative care managed to do away with the specialty of palliative care because we managed to communicate and teach and train all of the ways we look after patients to the rest of the medical profession and to the NHS writ large that actually we didn't even need specialist palliative care teams because somehow palliative care and how to look after patients at the end of their lives became the bread and butter job of everybody else, not just in a, in a hospital, but in a GP practice and out in the community as well. And that's a little, one little vision I have of the future, and I don't think it's unachievable. Um, but also, I mean, this is certainly my experience in Sobel House. The, the work that 
professionals do within Sobel House where the doctor, nurse, OT, physiotherapist is augmented very much by the volunteers who are there as well. And sometimes this will be as simple as um, the volunteers who, who go around the ward offering drinks, cups of tea to patients and their families, sometimes will end up sitting down and having a really important conversation with a, a, a patient. And it might not have anything to do with the nuts and bolts of their medical condition, but it's certainly profoundly important to their end of life condition. And maybe they'll come and talk to us, the medical team, about that. And it's incredibly important to have that backup. And there's no reason why we couldn't have a volunteer service like that that reached out onto the wards of my main hospital, a, a, a part of which the hospice that I work in is. It doesn't have to be confined to a hospice environment, and yet it is at the moment. There aren't volunteers like that. I, I can't imagine why, really. I don't know why we, you know, we, our volunteers in my hospital are sort of very much um, sequestered in the Hospital League of Friends cafes. We're all human. We can all make those humane connections with people who are frightened, vulnerable, bewildered, scared in hospital, which is probably most people. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could harness that somehow? And, and, it, and in a context of profound understaffing, it could be incredibly powerful. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I think ending on that vision of a vision where we're no longer needed is a great point to stop. Um, so thank you again. Thank you to Rachel and to Linda. Thank you.